Hello once again. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do a little bit of an introduction to these things called functions, right? So throughout the rest of your mathematical career, you're going to run into these things, right? Functions are an important piece of a lot of mathematics. So, you know, I, I know that you've got a, <laughs> don't have the same fancy diagram that I have over to the right there, but what we're going to do is we're going to kind of finish off these definitions first, right? So first thing we got to talk about is a relation, Right, so a relation is just a set of ordered pairs, right? Which we also know by another name, ordered pairs are just points, right? So when we're talking about a relation, we're just talking about a bunch of different points that are on a graph, or that can be put on a graph. We also have these things called inputs, right? And then that's the number that we plug into a function. Right, so that's the x value of the points, right? So an input is the x. The domain is all of the possible inputs for a function, right? So, you know, if I have certain x's that wouldn't work, those can't be part of the domain, right? It's all the possible x's that would work. The output is the number that a function kind of spits out at us, right? And that is our y value. Right, so we plug in an x, it does some sort of funky math and magic, and then it spits out an output, which is the y. The range is kind of like the domain, except the range is all the possible outputs from a function. Right, so domain is all the possible things you can put in, the range is all the things you can get out. And then last but not least, we have this thing called a mapping, which, you know, we're going to use here. It doesn't pop up a whole ton, but it is a useful tool to kind of know about. It's an illustration of how the domain and range will pair up together, right? So we're going to take a look at how to do those, right? But first, let's kind of make sure we get the idea behind functions down. So over on the side here, right, I'm going to try and leave everything up all at the same time, right? We've got the function omatic, which is that big box. It says that it only takes quarters, and then you have a choice between Reese's peanut butter cups, Hershey's milk chocolate bars, and Snickers. So... When we're talking about functions, right, a function is kind of like a big box, right? You can kind of think about it as like a machine that you plug numbers into and it spits out other numbers, right? But to kind of get a, a handle on the idea of inputs and outputs and domain and range, right, it can be helpful to think about it as kind of like a vending machine in a way. So this vending machine only takes quarters, right? So when I'm talking about the domain, all the possible inputs for a function, that's what we're talking about, right? We can only put in quarters. If I had some dimes, nickels, and pennies in my pocket, or even a Kennedy half dollar, right? None of those are things that we can put into this function, right? Those are not part of the domain, right? What is part of the domain is quarters. You could probably even probably use a Canadian quarter if you wanted to, right? So those are our inputs. Then we kind of rumble through, and then our choices are the only things that we can get out, right? The outputs are all either Reese's, Hershey's, or Snickers. So when we're talking about the range, it's these three choices we have there, right? Those are the three possibilities that we can get out of this function, right? So I can put in quarters. I can only get out those three different things. So that is our range, right? Hopefully that kind of makes sense a little bit. That's how I like to think about it and helps me you know, work through it a little better, right? So when we're talking about relations, right, we can think about them as ordered pairs, right? You can think about it as, you know, oh yeah, x, y. You can think about them as a table of values, which I'll sketch up a quick one right here, right? You got two columns, you got x, you got y, and then you fill in with different numbers, like negative 2, 0, negative 5, 3, and so on, right? You can have them on a graph, right? You'd, do a quick little sketch of a graph, and oh my, that's so bad. <laughs> that's okay, right? And you have these different dots on it, right? You could show relations that way. Or by a mapping illustration, which is a little bit hard to show on here. Um, actually, maybe it's not, right? We're going to end up having two different boxes with some space in between them. We're going to have numbers on one side, like 2, 3, and 7. And on the other side, we'll have some other numbers, like maybe 0, negative 1, and 10. Right? And it's just kind of helping us point and show what the relations are, like which numbers kind of go to which other numbers is the way we're going to talk about it. Right? So these are the four different ways we can talk about relations. A lot of times you're going to see them as ordered pairs or on a graph. 
Again, mapping illustration is a good tool to have access to, but it doesn't show up a whole lot, if I'm being honest. Right? So one of the things that we're going to be trying to do is be able to state the domain and range of a relation. Right? So when we're doing something like this, what I want you to start by, off by doing is just write out the words domain and range. Right? And what we're doing here, right, it's not really going to be too fancy, right? The domain is all the possible inputs, right? And up top at the top of this page, we were talking about how the inputs are the X values. So all I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at all these X's. Right? I have four different ones, so I'm going to write all of them down. Our domain is 2, negative 2, 5, and negative 1. Right? So those are all the numbers in our domain. The way that we kind of capture them and keep them all together, right, is that we use the, the curly braces. So I'm going to do a zoop on that side and a zoop on that side, right? Um, so when we use those braces, we're saying that, like, all right, all these numbers are in a group together, right? The range is kind of the same deal, except now we're talking about the y values, right? So if I'm looking there, right, I, I'm going to start off with a curly brace. I've got 5, I've got 3, I've got negative 2, and then that last one is also negative 2, right? So if you have a number that repeats and you've already written it down once, you don't need to write it again, right? It's just like if I go back to my candy vending machine, you know, the outputs, I have two Snickers, three Reese's, and three Hershey bars. I don't need to write down Reese's three times, Hershey's three times, and Snickers twice. I would just write down one of each because those are the possibilities that I could get out. All right, so that's kind of what we're doing when we're stating the domain and range. All right, so something I'd like you to do is you know try out number two. Right, it's pretty similar. Take a quick sec, see if you can do the domain and range. Pause here and unpause, and you think you got it. All right, so hopefully you gave it a shot. I'm gonna write out domain and range, and we're gonna take a look here. All right, so again the domain is all the different X's in my relation. So we've got 4, 3, negative 4, and 0. Right? As far as the range goes, again, I'm looking at all the different Y values we have. So we've got negative 3, 2, 1, and then I have negative 3 for a second time, which, again, we don't need to write it out if it shows up more than once. Right? So domain... So those four numbers range as those three numbers, right? Um, if you wanted to sort them from smallest to largest, you could do that. It's not something you need to do, though, right? If you just want to write them down as they are, perfectly fine. All right, so now that we've kind of just written them, right, we're going to express this as a table, a graph, and a mapping, right? So to represent this as a table of values, right, we have these four points up top, 2, 5, negative 2, 3, and so on. All I'm going to do is I'm going to transpose that information into this table of values here. So if the x is 2, you know, that point, the other part of that point that matches up with it, the y is 5. Right? If I have negative 2 for x, then the y is 3. Right? Same deal all the way down. 5 goes with negative 2. And then we're going to need to spit ourselves into another color here. Let's go with a nice purple. If we have negative 1 for x, we have negative 2 for the y. Right? So that's all we're doing, is we're just kind of throwing that information all into the table of values together. Nothing too fancy. Right? As far as the graph goes, what we're going to do is we're just going to plot those points. So 2, 5. Right? So remember that your points are x, then y. So I'm going to go over 2 and up 5. Right, so that first point is going to be right up there. Second point that I've got is negative 2, 3 in the red. So I'm going to go left 2 for the negative part, and then up 3 for that positive 3 for the y. For the blue point, I need to go over to 5, 2, 3, 4, 5, and down 2 to get us that blue dot on there. And then last but not least, negative 1, negative 2 is going to give us that purple one there. Right. So those four dots are another way to show this relation by those four ordered pairs or points. Right. So hopefully this isn't anything too groundbreaking so far. Right. It's all stuff that you've hopefully seen before or kind of makes sense. The new one is this domain and range part over here. Right. So this is where we're going to do the mapping. 
So when we're doing the mapping, we need to write out our domain and range. So just kind of like we practiced on the last couple, I'm just going to write out my domain and range in these boxes. So my domain is made up of two. We've got negative two. We've got five, if I switch colors there. And then we've got negative one. All right, so those are all the X values from those points we started out with. As far as the range goes, same deal. I'm just going to run through. I have a 5. I've got a 3. And then I have a negative 2, right? And that negative 2 repeats itself on the last one, right? So we don't need to write it down twice. We just write it the one time. So now that we've got all of this in those two boxes, the way that we show the mapping is we just have to kind of point from the domain to what number it matches up with in the range. So that 2, that black 2 there, matches up with 5 because they were a point together. All right, so 2 goes to 5 is how we would say that. Negative 2 and 3 in the red, right, those matched up as a point. So negative 2 goes to 3. Same deal for the blue. 5 goes with negative 2. And negative 1 also goes with negative 2. Right, so you can have them go to the same point. Right? So, we, you know, as we saw there, negative 5 and negative 1 both have negative 2 as their y value. So they both go to negative 2 like that. Okay. So what I've done is number 4. It's got a star on it. <laughs> I did this ahead for myself. To try and make this so this video isn't 45 or 50 minutes long, um, I'm going to, you know, do some of these out ahead of time. And I'm going to ask you to try and pause here. Try out number 4. I've got number 3 up here as an example. And then... I've already kind of done it out, so pause here and give it a shot. And hopefully you gave that a go. Let's see how you did, right? So turning it into a table, nothing big and fancy, right? You just plug all those different pieces in, X and Y, and then X and Y again, right? As far as the points go, same deal. We're just plotting points on a graph. Hopefully yours looks something like that. And then as for the mapping, right, same idea. We write down our domain on the left. We write down our range on the right. And then I've got arrows that kind of point where they match up. Right? The only real interesting part about this one is that 4 goes to negative 3 and 0 goes to negative 3, right? Because they both have negative 3 as their y value, right? So hopefully that's kind of all right. If you end up having questions about it, that's what I'm here for. Make sure to ask, right? We're going to talk about some variables, right? So independent and dependent variables are something you may have heard about in science class before, right? So the independent variable, right, is one that's just kind of doing its own thing. It doesn't really mind what something, some other value is doing. It's, it's just kind of doing its own thing. It's independent. So what we're going to say is that the independent variable is the variable that represents our inputs, right, or our x's if you wanted to say that way instead, right? The dependent variable, as the name implies, depends on something else, right? So it depends on our independent variable, right? It's the variable that represents our outputs or our y's, right? So um, an example is, you know, as the weather gets colder, right, the number of leaves on trees decreases. Right? So the independent variable is the weather, right? It's getting colder. We're getting closer to wintertime as I record this, right? The dependent variable is the number of leaves on trees, right? As the weather gets colder, the trees kind of shut down for the winter. They drop their leaves, and there we go, right? So independent is, you know, the timing and the temperature. The dependent is how much foliage there is. All right, so what we're going to do, and I, again, I did this for number six already, but to zoom out and kind of show number five all together. We want to identify the independent and dependent variables for this relation that says the junior class dance committee is selling tickets to the homecoming dance. The more tickets they sell, the greater the amount of money they can spend for decorations. All right, so what I would suggest on these is start off by kind of identifying what your important bits of information are, right, as I struggle with the highlighter thing here. So junior class dance committee, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through it again. I'm going to kind of grab those important pieces. Selling tickets to the homecoming dance. The more tickets they sell, right, that sounds like a quantity that we might want to pay attention to. The greater the amount of money they can spend for decorations. 
right? So all that stuff I just highlighted is pretty important to us. So we've got the, the number of tickets they sell, right? And the amount of money they have to spend on decorations, right? So if you had to try and, you know, frame it, which one seems like it depends on the other, right? Does it make sense to say that, you know, if they sell more tickets, they'll have more money for decorations? Or does it make more sense to say if they spend more money on decorations, then they will have sold more tickets, right? And I know it can kind of seem a little tricky, right? This is honestly one of the harder things we're going to be talking about today, right? But what we're going to say is that, you know, the more tickets they sell, right? If they sell more tickets, then they'll have more money to spend on decorations, right? So the number of tickets they sell, that is our independent variable, right? The, the number of tickets you're selling doesn't really matter how much you've spent on decorations, right? You could try and sell people and say like, oh yeah, no, we spent so much on decorations, it's going to be great, right? But that doesn't necessarily work all the time, right? The amount of money that you have that you can spend on decorations is our dependent variable, Right? Because it depends, right? You're not going to have as much money if you didn't sell as many tickets. Right? So one kind of has to come before the other. Right? You've probably already seen <laughs> number six done at already. Right? This one is honestly maybe even a little trickier. Right? Identifying the independent and dependent variables for this relation where generally the average price of going to the movies has steadily increased over time. So this one's difficult because a lot of people don't think about time as a variable, right? Time just kind of keeps on happening. It doesn't really care what's going on, right? It's like, oh, no, I'm running late. And time is like, well, sucks for you, right? So <laughs> time is our independent variable. And this is almost always going to be the case when we have something that works with time. Because time, again, is going to keep ticking, right? Time doesn't care about ticket prices, so it's independent. The price of going to the movies is dependent, right? It cares about time passing, right? As time passes, you have inflation, you have like increased costs for like movie budgets and stuff that they got to try and recoup through ticket sales, right? So price of going to the movies does depend on time, among other things. Right? So let's actually talk about functions, right? So, so far, we've just kind of talked about relations and variables. So a function is a relationship between inputs and outputs. All right, so, you know, we've been showing the relationship between inputs and outputs, right? We can write them as ordered pairs. We did the mapping. We can show them on a graph, right? But a function is like having a very specific kind of relationship between inputs and outputs. One of the ones that we're going to talk about today, and that you're probably going to see quite a bit in the future, is a linear function, right? It's a specific type of function where the inputs and outputs make a line. Right? So it's where, you know, if I graphed all of the different members of our function, right, they will show up in a straight line on a graph. So the way that we're going to do this, right, and the way that we're going to determine if this relation is a function or not is a little tricky, <laughs> right? What we're going to do is I'm going to write out quick little domain and range boxes here, right? So on the left is our domain. You can just put a D, range is on the right. All right, so I'm going to write out my domain and range. So for my domain, I've got negative 2, 0, 3, and 4. For my range, I've got negative 3, 6, another 6, and then a 9. All right, so when I'm mapping this, negative 2 goes to negative 3, 0 goes to 6, 3 goes to 6, and 4 goes to 9. Right, so the hard part to kind of grasp here is that this is a linear function, or I did, sorry, it is a function because each member of the domain goes to just one specific number in the range, right? So it's a little tricky, right? Basically what we're looking at is on this mapping, every number in the domain just has one arrow traveling out from it right? Negative two. If you, if you plug in negative two, you know where you're going. You're going to negative three. If you plug in zero, you're going to six. Plug in three, you're also going to six, right? It's okay if they go to the same place, right? Because you know where those specific numbers are supposed to go, right? 
it might be a little bit easier. Let's take a quick look at number eight, do kind of the same deal to start, and then we'll kind of compare the two and talk about the differences. All right, so same thing. I'm going to do my domain and my range. Wow, look at those wonderfully drawn boxes. So for my domain for number eight, I've got one, three, five, and then one repeats itself. For my range, I've got four, two, another four, so I won't write it again, and then negative four. All right, so if I do the quick mapping for this, right, one goes to four, three goes to two, five goes to four, and one goes to negative four. Ooh. So, again, the difference between seven and eight is right here where I'm going to highlight in just a half a second. Number one on that one goes to two different places, right? Um, one way that you can kind of, that helps me think about this, is imagine that I'm plugging these things into a GPS, right? I know that, you know, if I'm looking back up at number seven way up there, if I plug in negative two, it's going to take me to negative three. If I plug in zero, it's going to take me to six, and everything's hunky-dory, right? Every, everything knows where it's going. Meanwhile, on number eight down here, if I plug in one, it doesn't know whether to take me to four or to negative four, which is kind of an issue, right? If I plug in three, it knows to go to two. If I plug in five, it knows that I should go to four. But it's just that first one that's throwing everything off, right? So what we would say is that... You know, number seven is a function, right? And, you know, the technical way of saying it is that every input has a unique output, right? Which, again, is just saying that, like, if I plug in a number in my domain, I know exactly which number in the range it should go to. Right. For number eight here, this is not a function. Right? And the reason that it's disqualified from that is that one is trying to go to two different places. All right? And that's really the big like breaking point there, right? It needs to have one specific place that it goes to. Okay. So again, this is probably one of the more difficult things we're doing. If you end up needing to ask about it a little bit, make sure you do that. Right? It's, it's a little tricky. All right, function notation. Right? It's something that you know, you've seen in like, TV shows and everything else in the past, but now we're actually going to learn about it. Function notation is just that. Right? you got a curly F like that and then an X in some parentheses right next to it. Right, and what we do is we talk about that, like if we're if we're saying it out loud, oops, this is f of x, or you might also say f at x. Right, so f of x or f at x. Right, so all that is just a big fancy way of replacing the y. So for number nine, all we're going to do when we're writing an equation y equals three x minus eight using function notation. All we're going to do is we're going to replace that y with f of x. Like, I'm actually not changing anything else. It's just another way of saying y. <laughs> right? So, the benefit is that, you know, one thing is that the, the function notation is a lot more powerful for reasons that we might not get into for maybe a year or more. Um, but it really just means that, like, all right, y is equal to this thing. f of x is equal to this thing. So on the next page, what we can do with functions is it makes it a little bit easier to, you know, talk about specific outputs, right? If I wanted to evaluate this function for that given input, all I'm doing is I'm saying that, all right, f at 2, what that really means is that y, or uh, we're evaluating this where x equals 2, right? Because it's f of x. If the x is equal to 2, I just plug that right in. All right, so when I do that, it's going to look like this. Right, something that we've done in the past. Right, I just replaced that x with the number it's supposed to be, right? The two. We're just gonna simplify, right? Negative four times two is negative eight. Plus that seven. Negative eight plus seven is negative one. And bada bing, bada boom, we're done. That's this is it.
This is what we're looking for. All right. Honestly, I don't have anything more to say about it. <laughs> what I'd like you to do, I'm going to leave that last one up there. Try out number 11, right? F at negative 1 when it equals 2x minus 3, right? Plug that in, see what you get. All right. So hopefully that went okay. Let's give it a go together. So if I'm plugging in negative 1, again, I'm going to replace that x with that negative 1 that we're plugging in. After that, it's just a matter of running through and simplifying. Negative 2 minus 3 at the end brings us to negative 5, and that is it. Right? That's all we're doing, right? Evaluating function notation might seem scary. It's like f at this thing. There's parent. Oh, my gosh. Right? But at the end of the day, all it really is just plugging in the number and working through it as we normally would. Right? 12, you can see that there's a little star on at the bottom of the screen there. Right? Like it is, well, I would suggest pausing here, trying that one on your own. But again, to try and make it so this video isn't any longer than it's already going to be, I already did it out. So if I plug in 4, right, my first line is just plugging in that 4 wherever the x's were. The second step is doing a little bit of multiplication to get to this point right there where the arrow is. And then that last couple of steps is, you know, simplifying down a little bit more and then smushing it all together we're going to get to 18 and that's it all right last but not least we're almost there we've got this thing called the vertical line test right and what this is is if we have a graph right and we can put our function on a graph it's real easy to tell if it is a actually a function so the vertical line test says that if a vertical line intersects a graph more than once then it's not a function, right? So let's kind of pop this on the graph and we'll see what we're talking about. So use the vertical line test to determine if y equals 3x plus 8 is a function or not a function. So when we're doing 3x plus 8, right, this is in slope-intercept form, so we've got our slope here, right, that's the 3. We've got our y-intercept, which is that 8. So I'm going to start up at 8 with that y-intercept. My slope, you know, it's 3, but I can also think about it as 3 over 1. So what I've got is I've got a problem, right? I can't go up 3, I run out of graph, right? So instead what we can do is we can go down 3 and left 1 to represent that same slope, right? If that's something that's kind of popped out of your head in the last couple weeks, that is okay, right? If you need a little bit of a refresher on it, I can, I can talk to you about it when I see you in person. All right, and then after that, all we got to do is we're going to connect these with a line. Wowee, look at that. Nice line. Oops. And we're going to apparently slide all the way across the page. All right, so we've got this line on here. To use the vertical line test, what we're going to do is I'm literally just going to draw a vertical line on my graph. If you give me just a moment to make sure that it comes out nicely. Perfect. So we've got this vertical line here, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of drag it around like this. So if at any point it crosses our original line more than once, then this isn't a function, right? And you can imagine that this goes infinitely up and down, right? If I kept this line going forever, we also need to keep that in mind. So right here, right, we can see that it intercepts way up at the top right around where that dashed line bubble is. Right, but it's only intersecting once. If I kind of keep dragging it, the point where it's intersecting is now all the way down by that blue dot we had, but it's still only crossing once. It's still only crossing once all the way throughout the rest of this, right? And again, even over here, it's still gonna cross if I extended that black line and this red line, right? So when we're using the vertical line test, we're trying to capture and think about every single possible vertical line, right? Imagine what I just did there, right? Drag it straight across. If it crosses more than once, it doesn't work out. Say, you know, and this is not part of this question, right? We would say that this is a function. Hooray, it passes the vertical line test. However, if I wanted to throw another thing on here just to talk about it, say that I had a graph that looked something like that, right? That blue line that I just drew on there. If I try to do the vertical line test, 
eh, doesn't pass. Right? This is not a function because it crosses a vertical line more than once. Right? So I'm pretty sure I've talked for long enough. Sorry that this first real lesson is a long one. Right? But if you have any questions, be sure to ask about them. We'll practice together. We'll kind of go over things we need to together. And I'll see you next time. Peace out.